Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. What are you celebrating today? For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My show is about celebrating, celebrating life, celebrating art, celebrating artists, celebrating whatever we can find to celebrate in this crazy world we're, uh, that we're living in right now. And today I am very excited because we are going to be celebrating an incredible comedian today. Uh, not only has he been working with practically every major comedian through the 80s, but he has also written this incredible book called Kicking Through the Ashes. Before I bring him on, I'm going to give you a sample of his work. So take a good look and we'll see him on the other side. Here he is. It Because I, I don't do the taxes. I don't know how to do the taxes. The accountants do the taxes. I treat them like voodoo witch doctors. I bring them a hefty bag of my papers. I leave. They come up with a figure. And I don't care how they do it either. As far as I'm concerned, as soon as I leave, they burn my papers and throw some chicken bones on a dirt floor. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, refund. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. No refund this year. I have to pay money. After the government kept all the money I'd lent them for the year, I have to pay it two dollars. Two dollars. I have to write out a two dollar check to the U.S. government. I mean, I was going to blow it off. Two dollars. I mean, what the? Then I got paranoid. If I didn't pay the money, President Reagan would come on television one night. Well, the reason we're not getting all our hostages back is we're two dollars short. <laughs> Money. Eddie, you owe me money. George C. Scott, the hustler. I just threw it in there for a little bit of like flavoring. That's all it is. It a, not a big joke, but you movie buffs will go. Very interesting, very interesting. That was good. Put in a George C. Scott line. Very nice, very good. I love that. Because money, that's what people fight about money, arguments about money. Couples know that. You argue about money. I think that the myth is that women spend more money than guys because they shop more. Guys actually buy more expensive things, it kind of evens out. But whoever's doing the bills, that's the one who flips out. <laughs> whoa! 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 Oh! Hey, babe, come here a minute! Come here, come here. We have a little economic discussion here. See, so you can't spend more than you take in. Stop me if I sound out of line. Look at these bills. There's yours, there's yours, there's yours. When you come up for air in these places anyway? There's yours, there's yours. You gotta cut down, you're spending too much money. What about your boat? What do you mean my boat? I need my boat. What do you mean about my boat? You know, you know that fish you ate last night that I caught with my boat? That fish would cost ten dollars in the store. I catch four thousand more of those fish. That boat pays for itself. <laughs> we don't want to look through here, cause I don't see any of your dresses making money here. That can be arranged. All right, all right. All right. <laughs> oh, they turned. <laughs> <laughs> they go, what, what was that? Was he cutting the woman up there? It became an acting piece all of a sudden, didn't it? As I mean, the things in your, in, that you have to have different activities. That's the whole deal. Men and women, we can't hang out together all the time. We drive each other nuts. No matter how much we love each other. That's how 
I believe that guys who've been married 15 years come up with hobbies like duck hunting. I mean, it's the only explanation I can come up with for a guy who wants to stand in freezing marsh water at five in the morning. He's out there going, well, at least she's not here. There are a lot of good things about romance. Back rubs. Everybody loves a back rub. But you know as a couple, when it comes to trading back rubs, you better get yours first. Because second in line always gets short chain. Uh, you gonna wake up for my turn? No. Yeah. Too good. Give yourself a back rub. <laughs> there are th certain things you do together as a couple, intimate things you do only after you've been together for a period of time. It takes a while to get into. But I don't care what else you've done on a first date, you'll never end a first date by going, Denise had a great time. Really, I did. Listen, though, before I leave, would you get these pimples on my back? <laughs> Come on, there's one in the middle I can't get to. Well, don't tell him that baby's not ready. Been watching for three days now. That baby's ready to go. All right, have it your way, but you're missing a good one there. Disgusting. Oh yeah. And those things to argue about jealousy. You're gonna argue about jealousy. Men get jealous. Women get jealous. Maybe some of you other guys have made a mistake I've made. You know, it's late at night. You're tired. You're not really thinking sharp. You're watching TV with your woman, maybe a movie on like Body Heat, an actress on the screen like Kathleen Turner. Your woman asks you that question, you think she's pretty? You say something stupid like, yeah. <laughs> Takes you a while to pay that one off, doesn't it? <laughs> hey dear, will you scratch my neck? Let's get Kathleen Turner to scratch your neck. <laughs> And sometimes your arguments come out of nowhere. Have you ever been waked in the middle of the night by the other person? Wake up, wake up. I had a nightmare about you. And this, of course, is Rich Heidner. <laughs> I am so thrilled that you are here today. And that is one of the funniest sketches. And I have spent the last three days just watching all of these sketches. And I, for it, first of all, it took you a while uh, to find that voice. And you talk yeah. about that in the book. Um, and let's talk about where we are right now, first of all. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. It took us a while to even get here uh, because of your schedule and my schedule and everything. So thank you for being here on a holiday. Um, and I want to ask you, first and foremost, how are you doing really in the midst of this crazy world we're living in right now? Well, I, I got to be honest with you. My wife and I, we just enjoyed it. We, we live on the side of a mountain and outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And I, I'm, I'm 68 now. I don't have to move around as much as I had to move around when I was 25. So I feel bad for the young people. But for me, it was like, you know, most times I make a, a, a date to go somewhere and then I spend the rest of the time trying to figure out how to break it so I don't have to go. So I, I didn't mind not going anywhere. We had a good time. Well, I'm originally from Conway, South Carolina, so I spent a lot of autumns in Asheville, North Carolina. Have the leaves started to peak right now? No, they're not peaking. This has started. This started to change. They, they, they just started. I know it's a big tourist destination. Absolutely. And people come to see the leaves change. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I want to ask you, because my show is Richard Skipper Celebrates, what are you celebrating right now? I know that you uh, were just down in Florida with your uh, parents, uh, so thank God they're still around. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I have something to celebrate every day. I mean, I, I, I got a new lease on life 36 years ago, and uh, 
I don't know. I'm just kind of grateful every day to be above ground. You know, <laughs> if I die tomorrow, I don't even be going, oh, he died too young. I've had a chance to do everything. 68, I've had a career. I've had family. You know, the reason I didn't go visit the pyramids, I didn't care to go visit the pyramids. I didn't really care. There's nothing, there's no bucket list for me. There's nothing like, oh, gee, I got to go do this or my life will be incomplete. I've had a great run. I'm in golden time. Really? Well, the truth of the matter, you were too busy living life. I mean, <laughs> it's all in the pages of this book. Yeah, I mean, yeah. reading this book, uh, first of all, I'm surprised, and I say this respectfully to you, uh, that you even remembered some of the episodes that you talk about in this book. Yeah, some some of the things I had, I, I threw out a lot of, I always kept like notebooks filled with jokes and stories and things that happened, I, but I had a few of those left and that was good. I had friends who remembered. Some of my friends have better memories than me. But when it comes to something funny, Richard, it, it kind of prints in my head. If it was something funny, it, it's it stuck in my head usually. Well, I want to talk a lot about the humor. First of all, I you know I asked you for a photograph, and there's a specific reason that I asked for a specific photograph. I asked for a photograph of you as a five year old, and here you are. And the reason I ask for this specific photograph is because to me, the five-year-old self is the purest self. Uh, it's that moment before you start school and peer pressure starts getting added on and you start becoming what your other students want you to become, what the teachers want you to become or not. Um, and if you can take us back uh, to who this little boy was. I know that you grew up in North Carolina, uh, I mean, here in New Jersey, uh, not far from where I live now. Uh, so take us back to this little boy and a little bit about who he was and the humor that you were finding uh, in your world, which wasn't always so rosy. You and I had very similar childhoods, I might add. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you said, when did things go bad? It was it was before that kid, <laughs> before that five-year-old, it was already turned uh but I, I, I know what I, I, all my pictures, I don't, I'm not a, I wasn't a teeth smiler. It was always sort of a little bit of a sardonic smile, always sort of a little bit. I always held something back. I always was careful. And I noticed that about me then. And, um, but it was always funny. I mean, that is around first grade, that picture. I was, uh, I was, uh, I turned five um, halfway through kindergarten. And so that, that's first grade. And, um, one of my friends, Steve Riley, reminded me this, that uh, uh, once we were we were drawing in class, just drawing, and he was drawing uh, uh, something below the water. I hit a boat, and he, mm -hmm. and he was drawing the bottom of his boat underwater, and he punched a hole in the paper. And he said, I said, got a leak cap? <laughs> and that was in Miss Kent's class in the second grade. You remember that story. You remember, and, <laughs> and we, both got, we both laughed like crazy. But, I, you know, I, I didn't remember that I was that, 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 that how much humor was important. I, I remember being an angry little kid, a frightened little kid, but um, friends of mine told me they, I told them jokes on the playground and I'd always have jokes and stories and I do them impressions of TV shows I saw in, um, in the lunchroom and cafeteria growing up. So that I, I always was trying to make people laugh. My job as I, as I realized that I got older was to make my mom laugh. My mom, uh, was, was pretty depressed. She was from North Carolina and, and she never really caught, caught it in New Jersey and she she had a lot of things to be depressed about and uh so her laugh was gold to me and if I can make her laugh that that was you know that that was really looking back it still is my job <laughs> she's 88 well you know, as her I, laugh, that's my day as I was reading about your dad it you know brought up a lot of memories of my own father they were very similar in who they were um both in temperament in their good moments and in their bad moments. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I related a lot to you. But there was something that you said in your book that really jumped out at me. Because when you hear a lot of comics talk about uh, their years in school, they talk about being the class clown. You said that you were not the class clown, that you were the uh, sidekick to the class clown. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of clown in me. I, I was sarcastic in my humor. I was... Um, uh, quick-witted um uh you know uh, we used to just cut each other down a lot our friends and i you know just we called it ball busting back then i don't know what rating you have for your show but that was like south jersey or jersey that but i i uh 
my friend, my good friend Tim McAllister, he was the class clown, and he he was just light. He was light with his humor. He still is. He was much lighter with his humor than I was. I mean, I grew up around people, and I talk about this in the book, who were funnier than me. They were funnier than me. I just had to do stand-up comedy, and 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 I talk about the reasons for that in the book. I mean, I had to do it. They didn't have to do it. I know Cam Melchiori, a friend of mine, he's a lawyer in, in Baltimore. Funniest guy I ever met that never did stand-up comedy. And he's still funny, but he never had that need to take the microphone and get on stage in front of a room full of strangers and make them laugh. <laughs> well, I mean, also reading the book, I mean, it's, you all these odd jobs that you had, I mean, you know, right, I mean, out of high school and, you know, uh, before embarking on your comedic career, uh, you, uh, for lack of a better word, were adrift for a while, you know, in terms of where the direction you were going to go. Um, and you, you, you're, and forgive me if I get the name wrong, your friend, uh, Slim, um, was he the one, uh, there's a very, and I, you know, if I was drinking, I was let's not, let's not call Slim a friend. Okay. No, but there was a line in the book that if I was drinking, I would have done a perfect spit take. Um, and this was the line about killing his girlfriend. Do you know yeah. which line I'm referring to? I don't know the line. I can't remember the line. <laughs> but, You'll have to find um, it. You know, that he he he, he killed his girlfriend. Right. And everybody was shocked that he had a girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I know. I know. It was so true. He was just, he was slim was who you think. He was like skinny guy with those long sideburns. He was just a small town greaser, you know, and, um, and, um, bartending when I was bartending. I love bartending because I got an audience. You know, I had a captive audience. I mean, they wanted drinks and they were around me. And I, so I loved that part of it. I also learned that, that, um, that I, <laughs> I could wear on them. That, that story about the punch board, how I, I could wear on them. You know, eventually there's a resentment build up. And when they got the chance to turn on me, they turned on me because I was just out there. I was really more of a heckler than a stand up comedian behind mm -hmm. the bar. But yeah, I learned, I learned along the way. I did a lot of different things and, Took me a while before I had the courage to go do uh, stand up. I mean, I, my insecurities about performing. Um, and the, you know, I mean, the book, I mean, it's a page turner. I don't want to give away too much, but there's so many one liners, you know, within the. I mean, you're a brilliant writer. Um, and I love the fact that you went uh, to uh, School of Law and uh, Screen Door Repair. And I know many lawyers who went to the same school, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, it was not accredited law school when I started, but, but before I finished, it became accredited with George Mason University. So I, I really did have jokes about, it, but there was no way I was getting into an accredited law school with my GPA from college. I always, for whatever reason, got lucky and scored well in in standardized tests, the LSATs or the SATs. But when it came to like actually day in and day out performing, you know, getting the grades, that's such a it's not even a surprise why I became a stand-up comic. I'm good for an hour on stage a night. <laughs> I can't work any more than that. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of a stand-up comic. I mean, first of all, let's go back to your father for a moment because humor got your father through a lot. Um, he had his comic albums. Um, he would recite jokes and things from the right. comedians that he went to see in the local clubs in New Jersey. Talk a little bit about that and the fact that the humor got him through uh, some of the rough patches that he was going through as well. Yeah, my, my dad, you know, I have so much love and empathy for him. What he grew up, he grew up a bastard son and, and he didn't know it, but he was certainly treated like it. He knew how he was treated, tied to a tree when he was a kid and all sorts of weird things. And so he had his own anger and fears and all and comedy was big for him. You know, that was his relief. I mean, he, people made, I mean, it is for everybody and it, it eased the pain for him. It's, and he went and saw all sorts of like 1959. I mean, he was down Atlantic City, go see Red Fox. Red Fox brings Don Rickles on stage. My dad's seen so many comedians. He used to go up to the Latin casino all the time. He's seen about everybody who's gone through there. Uh, you know, he go down Atlantic City and see comedians. He just loved seeing comedians. He had comedy albums. My dad, when, you know, we watched a Jackie Gleason show. That was church for him, man. That was church. You better not talk during that show. You know, and I, and I learned, you know, and uh, 
he just so I grew up with that, and he was a funny man himself. He has a quick wit. He always has been. I remember once I I broke my foot in a bar, and a and I, and I called my dad, and I was like, "Hey, dad, I broke my foot. I was I was dancing in this nightclub, and some guy came down on my foot, and he broke it." My dad went, "Dancing women, they're lighter." <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just, he was quick. He's always been quick, you know. And uh, and I love him intensely, you know. I mean, I but so you, understand. You think your father was a frustrated uh, comedian himself? No, he was not going to do, do it. There's no way anybody in my family is going to do it. It was shocking to everybody that I did it. They still can't wrap their heads around it. I think to this day. You know, well, I mean, yeah. let's go back there. I mean, first of all, it's one thing to have a desire. I mean, I grew up in a small town and same thing for myself. The fact that I was going to leave and pursue a career in this business, um, it's it was something that no one could wrap their head around. Um, you're going to do this. Uh, I mean, you come from a working class family. It was right. not anything that they could wrap their heads around. Um, right. Take us back to that mindset of explaining this to your family, telling them that this is something you're going to pursue and you're going to go after it. I, I had choices when I came out. All the choices were coming back to my hometown. My dad's good friend was the, the prosecutor in the county and he wanted me to come in his office. So I wanted to go work with this defense lawyer named Basil Beck, who was a wild guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I, I, I just knew I could, I had to do this. Stand I was totally seduced by the laughter. There was nothing more healing in my soul to hear it. And um, I had no idea how I was going to make a living doing this. I mean, it was laid out. I mean, I knew what I was going to make in the first year as junior partner to Basil. I knew how much money I'd be making. And I'd never seen that much money in my life. To me, it was a lot of money. Now, this it was, was about the money. This was 1979. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah uh, and yeah. Uh, I mean, there are photographs of him in the book, long hair, beard. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Antithesis of what you would think he would look like. No, yeah, he was. He, it was funny. He was a Republican by party and he was liberal my dad was a democrat and he was conservative that's like that's like so funny how very different world yeah they, it was a different time right obviously but i just i had no idea i was going to new york city to live i didn't know how i was going to make a living doing stand-up comedy i didn't know anybody who was all the comics i knew i met in washington dc or were doing comedy in washington dc none of them were making a living doing comedy the guys coming down from new york city all had other jobs and people were just eking out maybe they were they 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 got some money here and there, but I didn't know it's like, oh, there's the path. You take this path. I didn't know anybody in the business other than the comics I'd met doing stand-up and nobody in my family who who were factory workers. My dad was a farmer as a kid. He 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 quit doing farming to, to start a little insurance business. And there was there's there's nobody in, in my family from either side that would go, Oh yeah, this is how you do it, and this is what you'll do. I just knew I had to do it. I knew I had to take that shot. It was mine. I don't know. I did it. Look, my dad, my dad was always the loud one. My mom was a quiet one. And when I told him that I was going to go to New York City and do stand-up comedy and not do law, my dad, he just slumped over, silent in his chair, and my mom screamed, what are you, crazy? <laughs> and, like, and, and yeah, I was. <laughs> and how did you start to acclimate yourself in New York City, um, you know, with the people that you met? met? I, I mean, you became friends eventually with uh, Bill Maher, who wrote the uh, forward to the book and everything. Funny, 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 funny uh, introduction to your book, by the way. Thank I mean, it, he, that I was hooked for the moment. I read the introduction and uh, read just everyone has to get the book to read the introduction. Yeah, all, all the people that I met, the ones that gave me book blurbs, I just met, became friends with. Yeah, I went up there, I didn't know. It was like, oh, I know these people. I didn't. I, I, a, a friend of mine was a musician, a drummer in New York City. He, he did not get to be the drummer in the East E Street Band. Uh, Max Weinberg did, and he, he was just disgusted with music business in New York City, and he wanted to get out. And so he took my apartment in Washington D.C. and I took his apartment. It wasn't even a really a legal apartment. It was a, it was a couple of walls put up in a basement in a in a in a building down in the Lower East Side. It was. It was so messed up, but I just moved up there and started going out to the clubs and hanging around and hanging around. And so comics like Mark Schiff and Glenn Hirsch and Rick Overton, and Carol Leifer, who became my wife. And mm -hmm. of course, Larry Miller and Jerry Seinfeld, these people were all established. Gilbert Godfrey, these were the established comedians and Kelly Rogers, the Catch Rising Star, and of course, Bill Maher. There were so many comics that, that there were about a hundred comics up there running around in these three showcase clubs, comic strip, catcher, rising star and improv. 
And you just had to go hang out and hang out and hang out and look for your opportunities. Somebody doesn't show up, you jump on stage and, and, and do well. And they go, oh, okay, the, this guy can, can hold the crowd. He can get his laughs and we can use him another time. You just build a reputation, like one set at a time and hang out and hang out, you know, and, and, um, and you work clubs with outside these little gigs in Jersey. You know, you work with people. I worked with Seinfeld at one. It was memorable to me. There were different times that I had the opportunity to, to uh, show up and, and, um, and you do things, you know, you just, you just, I don't know. You just hang it. You just, I just lived it. I didn't take off. I didn't take a minute that I wasn't thinking about stand up comedy, being on stage, going to the stage, coming from the stage. That's all I cared about. That's all. I, that's I mean, there are worked. certain things that I learned reading this book about that whole vibe. I mean, there are certain comedians that actually would go to the clubs early and they would uh, really acclimate themselves with the audience. Something that I uh, was new to me, you know, working the audience, going out, meeting the people in the audience, yeah. standing in line with them as they're waiting to go into the clubs and everything. And then there were others that did not do that. Um, and, you know, you you know, your take on all of that and uh, what you learned about the pros and cons of that world. Yeah, I, 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 one particular night where you actually had to be asked to leave the stage to get ready for a show that was going on. Uh, and then later on, you were brought back on stage and the audience <laughs> is sitting there. <laughs> so, okay, you're talking about when the comedy club started opening in the, in the early 80s, they were just opening everywhere fast. And you just go out on the road. That was the time uh, uh, Bill Hicks and I went out to do like two weeks, Tulsa and then Oklahoma City. And we ended up out for like eight weeks. They sent us to the next club and then the next club. And so we end up in um, Lubbock, Texas. It's mm -hmm. called it Lubbock. And of course, you know, we were little rock stars back then. All oh, the drug dealers would show up the first night. And you had your choice of who to hang out with. And um, I was addicted to cocaine and alcohol and anything I could get my hands on. And I, I was gone. And so the club the next day, it's a new club. They had arranged for me to do an interview with a local television station at the club before the show they couldn't find me so for finally they ran me down at this drug dealer's house and they they get me over i'm still in the clothes that i had on the night before i have not been at, at the bed and they bring me into this club and i again i'm told this and i i kind of have little memories of what happened but i i do the interview. i'm sitting on the edge of the stage doing this interview with this woman reporter or interview and and she leaves, and apparently I just passed out. I just laid back on the stage and passed out. And everybody in the room who worked there, they just sort of kind of got used to seeing me laying on the stage there. And so the audience came in. As the audience coming in, I'm just like this body laying on the stage. And then finally, the place is packed, and and one of the waitresses is like, uh, you have to get up now. We're going to start the show. <laughs> I stand up and stagger off the stage and go back into my – the hotel was right next door, a little motor court hotel. Mm -hmm. And I go in there and I shower and shave and put on a new suit or new clothes or whatever I was wearing, come back. And he always goes, isn't that the drunk that was just passed out on the stage? <laughs> yes, that's tonight's entertainment. But that's, it was the road. That was the road. You you know, you, I mean, I I had blackouts and I'd wake up, you know, 30, 40 miles out of town in some trailer park and no, I have no idea how I got there and how I'm going to get back to the airport. Well, you, you talked earlier about this being in your uh, in your bones. It was something that you really needed to do. I mean, the, I mean, the book mostly is about, I mean, your career through the 80s and everything, but there's a huge chunk of your life through the 70s as well when there was so much change going on and the struggle also of trying to get to that point where things were going to happen for you. Um, and you're meeting a lot of people along the way. A lot of things that are not so pleasant are happening as well. And not so good reviews and uh, you know, not so good appearances and everything. What gets you through this? What keeps you going? Uh, there's one section where you, uh, an incredible chapter for every artist, theater person, uh, performer, entertainer to read about the longevity of comedians in this business. Um, and I like you go through and you give examples of even Mark Twain at one point being called essentially a has-been in the business. Um, what kept you going through all this? 
I, I love the creative life. I really do. I like coming up with something in my head, turning into something. I go on stage, people laugh, I, or I read it like you, you're talking about. I love the creative life. That's what I just determined I really love. I mean, the laughter is is a purely a drug. I mean, I remember interviewing Greg Gerardo for this movie, I Am Comic, that we did a couple of years ago. And he talked about the feeling of the laughter, like you could feel the laughter. And I was like, absolutely. I mean, I can hear the laughter like a musician hears different notes in an orchestra. I can hear the high, the women laughing more than the men or the men laughing more than the women. I can hear the different different laughs. I can hear the tone of them. Uh, it, it's just it's just amazing. And it's in, in my bones always have been thinking, more thinking about getting laughs than anything else. I mean, I did so many things just to get laughs back in high school and college, just to, that's it. That's all I care. Just get, just to do this thing to get laughs. And um, while other people were you know, planning to be a doctor, I really was planning to be a comedian, but I didn't know how I did had no idea the path. I had no idea how I was going to get there, but looking back, you know, this, I had this professor, Harry Bullock changed my life. He changed my life. I love this guy to this day. I, I think of him that he just looked at me. I did this thing in his class where, I, you know, everybody was supposed to do a speech and I had to take public speaking because it was, a, I needed a grade. I was flunking out of school. And my friend said, this guy, Harry Bullock, he, he won't, he'll give you at least a B. You just get a B, man. I said, I need a B, man. I need. It. So um, everybody else was doing speeches, right? They're doing Gettysburg Address or this or that. And I took a David Bowie song called Changes and I had an idea that if I just read the lyrics to the song straight face, that when I went ch 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 changes, right? When I did that, I would get a laugh. I just had a feeling that, that I had, and it did. And after the class is leaving, Harry Bullock goes, he says, can you do that again next, next time? Can you find something, way to give a speech where you get a laugh? Can you do that? And he just, I wrote, I then I went out and I wrote a parody of uh, Sympathy for the Devil, this Rolling Stones song to, Sympathy for the insurance sales. I'm not really just slamming my dad. <laughs> but it got laughs. And that was Harry would be like, and he turned me on to different things of comedy. He turned me on like the Dr. Strange love movie. He turned me on to different things. And he encouraged me to write sketches for the school and all these other things. He encouraged me. And that man, uh, you know, is just quite a, quite a, you need somebody like that. That's not your friend, some stranger, really. That's what he was to me, you know, until mm -hmm. I got to meet him and know him. Somebody who goes, you, you're funny. You need a, that's what you do when you first time you go in front of a group of strangers. You're, you're trying to see what you can get laughs from strangers. That's important. Mm -hmm. that, to let you know that, okay, I really do have something here. It's not just my friends because they know me and they've known me forever and blah, blah, you know. Well, in the midst of all this chaos that's going around you, uh, you also credit Sinbad, who was like, <laughs> this, uh, you know, who yeah. was like this calming, you know, and I remember. I remember vividly the first time I saw Sinbad uh, on television on Star Search, um, and he was this squeaky clean uh, comedian who was the antithesis of everything else that we were seeing at that time. Uh, not, 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 not just a, because of the material, but his attitude. He was a force of nature, and I mean, I look, I, I was out there, and and in, in a book I talk about, it, I was drinking and drugging and smoking, and everything else that goes with it, and. I was running out of steam and, but I, but I was a, you know, nobody, I didn't worry about following anybody. I, I was, I was a lot of energy myself and I'd never, you know, everybody who opened for me middles, I just look at them one like, okay, this is, I got what you're doing. And I just don't worry about first time Sinbad goes on stage in front of me down in Texas. I went, uh Oh, this guy, he was, he was coming, man. He was coming from my scalp. It was like, he was absolutely you know, he, he, you could tell he had the love of it. He had the love of being up there The people when you would love being up there, you know, making them laugh, they love you back. And he had it and he was bright. And, and, you know, we did it. We did the um, couple one nighters. Then we did this uh, show at the, uh, they used to do a rodeo, a prison rodeo in Texas. I think it was in one of the Richard Pryor, uh, um, Gene Wilder movies. They mm -hmm. should have it, but they did a rodeo and they had Simad and I come there to perform for the prison. Uh, all the rodeo guys and some other select prisoners and, and prison officials and Sinbad and I did a show there 
And then we drove a couple one nighters and then we go to end up in Austin for a week at a comedy club there. So we hung out for almost like two weeks driving them together. And he's one of those guys who he starts talking five minutes before he wakes up. He doesn't stop talking until 10 minutes after he falls asleep. But he was just not that I'm like nursing hangovers. But I never forget we were sitting in a bar one night after the show. I'm down in the end and I'm sneaking in the bathroom to do coke and drinking my shots. And I'm down in the table. I can't talk to anybody. You know, I'm not being good. And he's down the other end of the table. And I could just watch everybody watch. He was just telling stories and being himself and being nice to everybody and fun. And everybody loved being around him. I go, I've lost what he has. I lost it. I had lost it. And it was only wasn't because he was younger than me. It wasn't because he was black and I was white. It was like he was living a different purity. I mean, he was just drinking Coca-Colas. He didn't smoke. Different he didn't type of coke. <laughs> what? I said a different type of Coke. Different type of Coke. Anyway, Richard, you know, he just he was he just modeled it. He modeled something different that I wanted. And and anybody will tell you when you, you need to have somebody that, that that's living differently that you that you have you want what they have. And he did. And that was a turning point for you. Yeah, it was. It was. There were other people along the way who said things to me about me being an alcoholic or like, you got a problem with this, a problem with that. They, but I did. I just move away from him and find somebody else. He never said a word to me. Never said a word. He just lived his life doing what he's doing. He never knew it. I know he never knew. I never said it to him. But th- but when I go to when I went to write that book, that that came into my mind. I thought this this guy. I didn't realize how important that was. But he was definitely important to me. Now, I'm going to get uh, to the book in a moment. I'm going to talk about the process of writing this book. But um, there's another chapter that I want to talk about because one of my uh, idols in this business is Merv Griffin. Uh, and you were um, a, a series of getting bumped on the show. Um, <laughs> yes. And I want to know, first of all, um, if you are like most uh, entertainers or performers, um, were you telling all your friends, I'm going to be on the Merv Griffin show tonight, tune in? Um, or did you not tell your friends? Um, because was it a, you, you kept getting bumped night after night after night. Uh, and then you can tell the rest of the story. Well, they, 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 the Merv Griffin show wasn't like the Johnny Carson show. They didn't tape it that night. You're on that night. There was a delay. And I can't oh, remember okay. what okay. delay was, but there was a delay. So you couldn't really figure it out. Uh, that way to tell everybody you're on it. But uh, I know I saw everybody was getting bumped because I was like liking the money. If you, you know, it, you, you you get your fee and I was, I only lived like two miles from the studio at the time in West Hollywood, just drive over to Hollywood, the studio, park your car, go in. They had a really great backstage. They had a, a an old school bartender, you know, with a tie and the old short sleeves and a, and a fully stocked bar. So I'd, I'd wait. They'd come and tell me I was bumped. I mean, this is like, you know, you get bumped once or twice, but this is like four, five, six days in a row. I'm getting bumped every day. I broke the record. I think Jimmy Brogan had the record before me. It was like three or four. I'm like up to seven. I'm like, so every night I'd have a couple of cocktails there, watch the show and drive home. I started thinking that was my job <laughs> to go get bumped because you get paid the whatever it was, five, seven hundred dollars plus, you know, come back again the next. So. And One you'd, night, you'd, I go, you'd get your drink and you'd have your cocktail and yeah, go, go home. home and go go then go do comedy at the comedy clubs. You know, it's just like a fantastic thing. It was like four in the afternoon, five, whatever it was. And one night, I I started. Well, uh, I know I'm gonna get bumped. Why don't I start drinking now? <laughs> it's not a good move. Not a good move, man. Because I knew I was an alcoholic before I was an alcoholic, and 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 I'm into my I'm into it, and and then. Les Sinclair, the booker, comes up and says, you're on in five minutes. I'm like, I had cocaine in my pocket. I go, well, I got to kind of try to kind of kind of get the balance right, <laughs> which never worked. You know, running in the bathroom, trying to get enough coke to, to stabilize the alcohol. And and uh, I went on stage. I, I, I might as well have been speaking another language. I mean, I, I think I got them in a rhythm. I, I did okay. But I messed up a lot of blah, 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 jokes. You know, I had a manager <laughs> at that time. My manager was sending me to speech therapy. Because they thought I had a speech defect. It was really just the alcohol and the coke. I want to ask you about this because you said that these shows were pre-taped. Why did they allow that to go on? Did they just think that this was just a speech impediment that you had? Yeah, or? it wasn't. I wasn't so bad that it was embarrassing. I mean, if if he waited two more drinks, it might have been worse. It wasn't so bad that I was embarrassing. And and believe me, I'd gone on stage in Murph 
once I spent the entire day with a Coke dealer and she and I, and I went and they called me up, you know, late to fill in for somebody at three in the afternoon. And I went over there just gacked out of my skull. And, uh, and that, and so I managed to pull that one together. I managed to pull off a few of them like that. And, and of course I got in trouble with Johnny Carson in, in this way, but I managed to pull them off and nothing disaster, nothing like falling down drunk or anything like that. But, um, I don't know, you know, um, I, they, they always sweetened them in, in Murph's show. I mean, I had that experience where I, later when they brought me on, I was, I was sober and I, I did a, a show that I had to follow uh, Diane Cannon, who was promoting a movie called Jenny's War, which was really about this mm-hmm. woman trying to find her daughter in a Nazi death camp, mm-hmm. something of that. Effect. Mm-hmm. And so they have a clip of her getting beat up by an, by Gestapo right before I come out. I mean, they show that clip and the whole audience that by, by strange coincidence, almost the entire audience that they are, are, are elderly people from a Jewish retirement home. And so they were in total shock when I walked on the stage and I was younger. I was blonde hair, blue eyed. I mean, I might as well goose stepped out on the stage, you know, <laughs> just, and I bombed Bailey and they, they sweeten it later. I did not turn on them. I didn't quit. I knew, I just had to do the jokes, but literally I was like Albert Brooks and network news. My entire suit in the back was just sweat, sweat, flop, sweat. But, uh, you see, so you had these experiences. You just have to le- learn, but then I was sober. So it was a different, different time for me. I mean, I could, I could, I could handle it in a, in a different way. I interviewed someone last week and he said that being, you know, his career was like being in a pinball machine. Uh, you, you, have an idea of where you want to go, but then you're thrown around <laughs> and you really have no control of yeah. where this is going to take you. What was the moment for you personally where you feel where you felt like you had made it in this business? Or do you feel like you still are reaching for that brass ring? No, I I, I feel like I'm still being creative. I don't I, there's things I want to do, but if I, I'm I don't know where I felt like I made it. I think everybody would say, oh, when I did my first Tonight Show, but I didn't feel like that Mm -hmm. made it then or sat on panel with Johnny the first time or did, I don't know anything to HP. I don't know. You know, I I don't, I feel like I've I've made my living doing stand-up comedy since 1979. That's what I feel like. And so I'm pretty proud of that. that. That's what I did. I mean, I paid my bills, paid the kids' bills, bought houses, cars, all these things. Uh, with stand-up comedy and writing for TV. I never thought I'd be a writer on television. I never, I was not like a sitcom fan growing up, a kid mm-hmm. that was like all into that. But, uh, you know, these things happen. I, I I like the pinball analogy your your other guests talked about, because it's true. You think you're doing this and you get flipped that way. And you, you better be a little bit light on your feet in terms of, you know, I think, I, I always think this, that very rare is an entertainer, uh, somebody in showbiz get to do what they came in the business to do their entire career without doing anything else. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you come in as a stand-up comic, then you got to be a writer for a while and, and maybe a producer. You you take different hats because very rare that people come in as an actor and just get to be an actor the whole time, you know, or something like that. Well, I want to ask you from the moment that you've really started to get the breaks in this business and to this moment that we're sitting in right now, the business has changed a lot. Uh, a lot. Uh, what are some of the things that you have truly embraced uh, in terms of the changes in the business? And what are the things that you are really frustrated with in terms of the world that we are in right now as far as comedy is concerned? Uh, there's nothing that's really frustrating me. I mean, I'm, I'm at the age now where, you know, um, Pete Townsend had a great line to John Entwistle, the, the, you know, in The Who. John Entwell, so the bass player came to Pete Towns at one point and said, um, you know, Pete, I really don't, under, I don't understand this rap music. I don't understand it. And Pete Townsend says, you're not supposed to understand it. We're just supposed to get out of the way. <laughs> so that I, is brilliant. I, it is right. But that's Pete Townsend. I don't, I don't have a grind about anything. I love all the changes. I love where it's going. I, I think there's more comics, greater comics. Yeah. There are hobbyists that, you know, every generation has a struggle to get to the microphone to learn how to do it. Where are you going to learn how to do it? How much stage time? It's all a function of stage time. And so 
our struggle was just finding places where they allow you to do it. I used to go into all kinds of weird places, not, not even so weird, like, you know, <laughs> uh, talent nights and DC and all these places and just talk my way onto the stage. And now they have to hack their way through so many hobbyists, people who do stand up comedy, never intending to turn pro used to be a heck of my generation. Somebody go, don't quit your day job. Right. Remember that? And now, uh -huh. and now if they yell at some of these comics today, the comic would go, I don't tend to quit my day job. I have a good retirement plan. I have full dental. What do you think? I'm nuts. This is just a goof. I mean, there are people doing it just as a goof. You never could do it my day. So those are changes, but I, I'm, I'm not, doesn't affect me. I, I, I think that, that, that social media is probably the biggest thing that I go, mm -hmm. you know, the whole aspect of everybody's a comedian now. You know, everybody's a publisher. Everybody has an opinion. They're, they're their own letters to the. Everybody's doing whatever. this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But I like this aspect of like you can do a show without leaving your your house. You know, without yeah. leaving your. I, I like that aspect of it. Yeah, um, I want to you know talk a little bit about the book. What was your process in writing the book? Um, obviously, you have laid bare a, a lot of your life. Um, how did you decide what to leave in and what to leave out? I had a real, um, you know, I left out, there, there's some nasty stories, some things, you know, and I thought maybe I'll put them in the second book. I didn't want to, I didn't want anything that I would have to, uh, I called a couple of people and said, you, you want me, you, you okay if I put this story in? Yeah, okay. So I called them. You know, I didn't want to put anything about people. I didn't, Ronnie Bullard, I did not call. <laughs> I put it in there. But I thought it was a good story for him. I didn't know, you know, I I, a couple times I didn't, maybe I should have called people, but um, I, I, I didn't want to put it. I didn't want to get negative with anybody. That's mm -hmm. what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to have to, to um, maybe, maybe it'll be a little rougher the next book. I don't know. <laughs> so what's next for you? I mean, well, I'm, I'm doing a show about the history. It's a, a history of stand up comedy show. So I, I love doing that. That's why I'm coming into, into to different places. I'm doing it in, in Los Angeles at the Yard Theater on the 21st and 22nd of this month, October. Uh, this is, I love doing this show. Uh, I want to write, I wrote a screenplay about the first stand of comic Artemis Ward. I wrote a screenplay about him. I want to write some other screenplays. And I just want to, mostly what I want to do is write. The only thing that really drives me in terms of performance is this stand up comedy show, the history stand up comedy show. Uh, but that's what I want to do that I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll film it in some place in some way and be, and now be move on. I'm not going to tour that thing for the next 10 years, you know, as trying to build up some sort of fan base with it. I'm going to get it down well and then film it, tape it, whatever you want to call it. And then but you're still doing stand up comedy. I mean, yeah, I still do stand up. I, I, and, 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 and I still do new material. I mean, I, you can't go up and not try something new. That was my whole thing growing up. Is there anything the to laugh at in today's world? <laughs> always, always, always. I'm joking, always. of course. I'm yeah, joking, yeah, always, <laughs> always. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who makes this, you this, laugh this. the most these days? Pardon? Who makes you laugh the most these days? Well, uh, Michelle Wolf, um, John Mulaney, Mulaney. Mulaney. Yes, yeah. Mulvaney. 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 They're two that I really like a lot, and they're comics. Uh, boy, there's there's so many great comics. I feel like I'm gonna, gonna, gonna miss a few, but but there's so many great comics. Of course, um, I watched Dave Chappelle's last special. I mean, he he goes into areas that nobody's going into, and I love his his attempt, his constant attempt to understand. And he does it through stand-up. And he wants people to understand him through He wants to try to affect the change with stand-up, which is very rare. So I love his his moves in this that that in that way. And um Rich, I so, think you know, excuse me, but you you get Dave Chappelle. I get Dave Chappelle, but he pushes buttons with some people. And well, there's been a lot of controversy with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know. What do you say to those people who are, I mean, there are people who are threatening to leave uh, Netflix. There are people, I mean, people who have other shows on Netflix. Well, uh, first of all, I mean, the, we are in an age of outrage. That is the number one delivery system for adrenaline today. Outrage, 
outrage where people love to be outraged. It's an mm -hmm. addiction. But in terms of this, I watched that special twice. And, you know, he made a real effort to, that people, they don't, a lot of people don't have good joke comprehension. I think what's really amazing is, is who can say what, who's allowed to say what. And they're going like, no, you can't talk about that. You're not allowed now, which is really interesting to me. It's a different part of comedy than I grew up with. You, when I grew up, it's, if you have an idea and it's, it's a good idea and it, you land, you land the joke properly. And that means you understand who's getting the pie in the face. Cause every joke, somebody's getting the pie in the face. So who's getting the pie in the face. If you look at those jokes that Chappelle did, there are a couple of them I say, yeah, close. Maybe there's a little uh, uh, incidental contact pie in the face, right, with a transgender person. Maybe he really was, like he said, I have problems with white people. He still, he was pretty clear about it. And I thought he was clearing the jokes when he did them. Um, people don't hear that. They hear what they, what triggers them. And, mm -hmm. and it, mostly it's like, who's saying it? Now, as a white guy, <laughs> my, what I can say is a white straight guy, it, it's like, you can't even do jokes about white straight guys. <laughs> so that's almost the mode today. They're like, you know, we, we don't even want to hear from you at all. We've heard enough of you white straight guys for years. I get it. I'm totally understandable. You know, we've abused our privilege. <laughs> I get it. But um, uh, I think it's, it's even kind of, you, you used to be uh, the more outsider your group was, the more latitude you had to make jokes about things. Look, when I got into comedy, there were still a lot of homophobic jokes going on. I love the counterpunch. I started doing jokes, making fun of the homophobes. I mean, I, that was my fun and, and, and do counterpunch. Look, Lenny Bruce, he, he was alive when Christine Jorgensen, who was the first person to undergo gender reassignment surgery back, That's I think right. it was 1961. So a lot of comics were doing jokes about Christine Jorgensen. Now they were just homophobic jokes. They were just repurposed gay bashing jokes. Mm -hmm. And I've heard a lot of them and I've seen, cause I've, I've studied it. Lenny Bruce didn't do jokes about Christine Jorgensen because he really didn't understand it. It would be impossible to understand that somebody who feels they were born the wrong gender and need to be, that need to be corrected. What he did was he made fun of the hacks who were making fun of Christine Jorgensen. That's what mm -hmm. he did. That's what a good comic does. You know, he protected the underdog. And I think if you look at it, um, Chappelle does do that. You know, I mean, I love his friendship with Daphne uh, that, that he talks about in the special. I can go on, on with this because I, I just watched the special twice, two nights in a row. Well, and I think comedy should shed a light on the world that we're living in. And, we and need you know, there, there, there's a there's a thing. Absolutely. And, and go on, and watch. You have to know where the joke is landing, who it's landing on. The first comic Artemis Ward said he was doing jokes about it was a new thing. Then the Mormons was a whole new religion back then in the 1860s and he was doing jokes about the Mormons and somebody said something about it. He said, you know, I think by doing jokes about these people, it will normalize them. It will let people see them in a different way. And he wasn't doing jokes that was too harsh. I mean, he was doing joke, like he do a joke, like his ticket would say, he did a ticket out in Salt Lake city, right? He did a show in Salt Lake city. He said, admit bear and one wife. And he had one in caps, one wife, right? Cause they were known as polygamous. And they laughed. They laughed. So it, there's a, always a line. And comics, to find the line, they have to go over the line. And then you come back to it. And um, I don't know. It's a, it's The whole thing is um, uh, uh, wild to me. But I think people, I think there's a lot of people who don't listen. I used to have this problem. I'd do a joke. Um, and a woman would come up to me after the show. This is always after the show, not during the show. And they go, I didn't like this joke. And I said, well, let's talk about it. And then when we talk about jokes, I said, see, the joke really was landing on me, not my wife. It was really making fun of me. So you have to know. And every joke is expresses a fear. Every joke exposes a fear or an obsession. Like the joke, the, 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 how is this show like open, totally open? Uh, we're we're going to go a little over, but uh, I don't want to go too long because I want to respect your time. And okay. Everything. Okay. I, I'm a... I'm, uh, Anyway, so so anyway, every joke expresses that, and I'm really into that. I mean, I think every comic has a responsibility, especially if you're working, you want to work the edge or you want to be, you got to know who this joke lands on. And I had that experience when I was doing a joke that, I, that was bashing these homophobes in my act. But I did a thing when I got to a certain part of the joke and I got some laughs. Then I did this, the gay guy, and I did him a little bit um, a lispy, a little bit wispy, you know, the character. It made him a little stereotypical. 
And I, and one night the improv in LA, uh, I came out to the bar after doing a show and this gay guy came over to me and he sat there and introduced himself, bought me a drink. And he said, let me ask you a question. Do you, uh, and so I get what you're doing, man. I really like what you're doing, but do you think that they're laughing at the guy when you do that gay character and he's a little, little bit fey, do you think they're laughing at him? the gay guy in a stereotypical way, or they laugh at the homophobe at that point. I went, Oh, in other words, if I didn't do the gay character, so stereotypically, you know, light and as low as I used to say, but in doing like that, would it be just as funny? And you know what? It wasn't as funny most crowds, but I, I changed it, started doing in a, in a, just a regular male voice. Right. Mm. Instead of that. And I took a hit for the laughs, but I still got laughs because it was a funny line. But I took a little bit of a hit just to 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 honor the bit. The bit was making fun of homophobes. So don't be hypocritical in the middle of your joke, making fun of homophobes by like playing the homophobe card. Yeah. You know? Anyway. That's great. Well, before we we're gonna wrap up in a moment, but I always like to end my show. This is my homage to James Lipton inside the actor's studio. So I've got some just some fun random questions that I'm just gonna throw at you that are just random. So, um, and the first question is, I'm a random guy. Uh, what's the weakest excuse that you've ever used? Uh, <laughs> 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 My weakest excuse ever was, uh, I'm sorry, I just had to do that. <laughs> okay. That's the weakest excuse. That's a good one. What is the greatest sacrifice that anyone has ever made for you? Um, a guy, a guy, I was in a bar fight and a guy who was not in a fight jumped over the table. A guy was about to hit me in the back of the head with a cue stick and a guy jumped over the table and, and knocked him out with a, with a cue ball in his hand. <laughs> wow. wow. So he jumped in the middle of my fight, had nothing to do with me or them. I always thought that was pretty bar, That's bar heroic. That's amazing. <laughs> um, what has been the single most important influence in your life? Well, for good or bad, my dad and my mom. I mean, for good or bad. I mean, That's all of it, you know. I mean, uh, my aggressives or even my people pleasing, all that stuff comes out of it. They're, they're the biggest influences without a doubt. Okay. Um, what has changed or redirected your life most dram dramatically? Quitting drinking and, and doing drugs on May 11th, 1985. God bless you for that. Not even close. Uh, what is the most worthy cause on earth for you? To be of service to somebody, to do something good for somebody and don't tell anybody about it. That's like the most spiritual thing I can do. And I, I strive for that all the time. And you're going to hear my closing remarks in just a moment. Uh, what is the hardest test that you've ever taken? The hardest test I've ever taken? <laughs> I don't know, man. I this guess... <laughs> This, this one, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you for bailing me out. I don't know the hard because I'm sort of thinking about test tests. I go, boy, I, the ones I didn't study for, which were a lot of them. Okay, what is the most important duty that you perform on a regular basis? To listen. Okay, and the last question: What was the hardest that you've ever fought for something? I'm still in the struggle of fighting for this Artemis Ward, his legacy. I'm still in that struggle. Nobody seems to want to care about this guy who was the first stand-up comic. I just I just want him to be recognized. And that's my biggest struggle right now. That's that's what I think about all the time. Well, Rich, I want to thank you for doing the show today. I want to tell everyone this is an amazing book. I want everyone to read it. Uh, don't go anywhere for a moment. I want to thank you all for being here today. I hope you all had a nice time. Uh, I know that I can speak for Rich when I say this. I don't take it lightly that you could have been anywhere else for the last hour. The fact that you chose to spin it for us uh, in this business, it means a lot to both of us. Uh, so if you enjoyed today's show, uh, please, if it's your first time here, uh, please consider subscribing to Richard Skipper Celebrates right here on YouTube. Uh, and check out the other people that I've celebrated up to this point. There are over 300 of them. And check out the others that are coming up ahead of us. Um, and also, please hit the like button, uh, leave a comment, share this with your friends. 
Um, it's a, all about building that audience and getting the word out there. Uh, that struggle never goes away. Um, I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go to your Facebook friends list, and I want you to reach out to the second person that pops up. Then what I want you to do is I want you to go to Amazon.com, and I want you to order two copies of this book. I want you to keep one copy for yourself, and I want you to send the second copy to the second name that pops up on your list. And I want you, this book is so phenomenal. Um, I, did, I barely scratched the surface with this purposely because I want you to read the book. It is such an amazing read. I could not put it down. Uh, it's an amazing book. And I don't know, I don't know how you remembered the details of this book um, with what you went through. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to write it. Um, I also end every show, you know, a dear friend of mine says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. So take the time to reach out to those people that matter to you. And I always say that if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. Now, Rich, I'm going to leave the screen and I'm going to give you the final word to yourself. Uh, anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message that you want to put out to anyone who's watching right now, uh, just say goodbye when you're finished, and I'll take you out, uh, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> I'm sure you've been told that many bars before. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Rich, for being here. Uh, I hope you had a blast. I certainly did. And thank you for doing this. Thank you. So I did not know Richard Skipper before today. Uh, he reached out, contacted me. I've done so many of these shows. He not only read the book, he went over the book. He he read my book. He he knew it better than I did. Such a great interview. He asked questions I've never been asked before about it. I'm really super impressed with this guy. I love this guy. <laughs> He's a real great character. He's a great interviewer. Somebody out there, give this man a show on some network interviewing people. I mean, he just has got that, that passion for it to get into somebody else's head and do it. Very difficult for me to get out of my own head, as you can tell. But I just want to put a word out there for Richard Skipper, and thank you for letting me do this show today. All right. Take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.